Well, folks, we are in the book of Philippians right now. This is the second of four weeks. Each week we're taking a chapter and, and diving in a little deeper. And uh, let me do a little bit of recapping So, uh, from where we started last week. The book of Philippians uh, is a letter that was written by the Apostle Paul. Paul, remember, was the guy who used to be called Saul. And he was the greatest enemy of the Christian church. And then something miraculous happened. God transformed him and Paul became the greatest missionary in the history of the Christian church. And Paul went around uh, the Mediterranean area starting churches. And one of those places he, he helped to start a Christian community was in the town of Philippi. Uh, Philippi is in the area between, great, between Greece and Turkey, uh, in what was known as Macedonia. And, and so um, what's happening here today is Paul is writing a letter to those folks in the town of Philippi. And so we get the name Philippians. Um, that's the people who live there. And while Paul is writing this letter, he's actually sitting in prison. He, uh, we said last week he had a problem. His problem was that he wouldn't stop talking about Jesus. And because of that, he was thrown in prison. And so from prison, Paul is writing this letter to the Philippians, encouraging them, uplifting them, um, calling them to continue on in this life of faith. And what I really want you to hear in this letter is, is that, that this is a personal correspondence. This isn't just some random words that Paul was throwing out into the universe, but rather a letter that he intentionally wrote to this group of people to encourage them in the faith. And I think these words still hold true for us today. But I hope that as you hear this, you'll, you'll hear that, yeah, this is really a personal letter that he's writing to encourage them and lift them up. And so you also may remember that he began the letter with these words, to all the followers of Jesus in Philippi to the followers of Jesus, that is, the Christians there, the believers, the saints. And and so with that in mind, today's letter is written to us as those who are following Jesus, the disciples of Christ. And that's what it means to be a disciple, to be one who follows. So you and I, like the Philippians, are followers of Jesus. In today's reading, in this second chapter of Philippians, he really dives into what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And that is, we are called to be imitators of Christ. To be people who are striving to live like Jesus. And not just live like him, but to think and act, to have attitudes like Christ had. And, and so in this second chapter of Philippians is a very well-known passage um, that's often referred to as the Christ hymn where he reminds us of who Jesus was and what Jesus did, and then reminds us that you and I are called to live just like Jesus, uh, to follow him in that way. So today's reading, I think, is really, um, really calls us to think deeply about who Jesus was and how that informs our own way of life, okay? So let's start here at the beginning of chapter 2. Listen to what what Paul says to the Philippians. He says, If you've gotten anything at all out of following Christ, if his love has made any difference in your life, if being in a community of the Spirit means anything to you, if you have a heart, if you care, then do me a favor. Agree with each other. Love each other. Be deep-spirited friends. Don't push your way to the front. Don't sweet-talk your way to the top. Put yourself aside. And help others get ahead. Don't be obsessed with getting your own advantage. Forget yourselves long enough to lend a helping hand. Now let's pause there for a a moment. So he goes through this whole list, right, of things that he's saying, hey, this is what it means to be a, a family of believers, to be followers of Jesus. It means that first and foremost, We are more concerned about others than about ourselves. And I love this phrase he uses. He says, be deep-spirited friends. Be deep-spirited friends. Remember, last week we said that Paul's calling them to get beyond surface level to a deeper level of fellowship and connection. And he says, be deep-spirited friends. Now, I wonder, as you look at your own life, and especially your relationships in this community Do you consider yourself to have any folks here who you would call deep-spirited friends? Some of you would say, oh yeah, and some of you would say, well, I don't think so. That's okay. But understand that as as we are a faith community, that's, that's very different than belonging to a church, right? It's very different than just being a part of the club. 
Deep-spirited friends means that we've got something at stake in one another's lives in relationship with, the, with each other. We do more than just get together here to sing a few songs and hear a message and have communion. There's something more at stake in this place. There's something deeper happening here. To be deep-spirited friends. Folks, that's what Christian community is about. And I want to invite you, if you were, if you were to say, I'm, I'm not sure I have any deep-spirited friends, I just want to put that out there as something for you to consider, to be praying about, to be thoughtful about, and understand that that's the primary reason for getting involved here in like a small group, a Bible study. It's so that you can have those deeper relationships that that go beyond, yeah, it's a nice day today, isn't it? Yeah, we had some fun plans on the 4th. That was great, right? Christ calls us to a different kind of community that's deeper than surface level. So something to be thinking about and praying about. So he's calling them to his deeper level, and now he dives into this, what we call this Christ hymn that reminds us of who Jesus was and what Jesus did. And I, I want you to have a little context for this, though, because he's going to remind us about how Jesus died for us. Now, as lifelong Christians, is that news to anybody? That Jesus died for us? No. There's a, there's a slight problem with that. It is that we sort of take it for granted. Like, yeah, Jesus died on the cross. We know that. What we, what we don't realize because it's so normal to us is that this was a revolutionary idea. Okay, going back 2,000 years ago and before that time, no one in human history would ever have considered worshiping a God who died. What kind of God is that, right? Up until this point in human history, you wanted on your side the biggest, baddest warrior God you could find because your, your, uh, your survival literally depended on it, okay? Now, just bear with me here for a moment. So when Christians come along and they say, well, we worship this God who died, in many ways that would have seemed like nonsense. It wouldn't have made any sense to people until you go deeper and understand what's really behind that. So I want you to have that context in mind as Paul saying this is who Jesus was this is what Jesus did and we're going to ask the question so why would Jesus do that and I think the answer to that question is pretty compelling so he says in verses 5 through 8 he says think of yourselves the way Christ Jesus thought of himself he had equal status with God but didn't think so much of himself that he had to cling to the advantages of that status no matter what not at all When the time came, he set aside the privileges of deity and took on the status of a slave, became human. Having become human, he stayed human. It was an incredibly humbling process. He didn't claim special privileges. Instead, he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. And the worst kind of death at that. A crucifixion. This is something that always has amazed me about Jesus. So so just follow me here for a moment. So Jesus is God. And Jesus decides, I'm going to become human. And not just for a day to see what it's like. Or, you know, according to like Roman mythology, right? You had, in Roman mythology, Greek mythology, you had the gods playing games and playing tricks on people and, you know, coming to pretend to be somebody for a day and, you know, doing kind of fun. That's the, that's the world that these people are used to, right? These, these are folks in Macedonia. They're aware of Greek and Roman mythology. Paul says, he didn't just try it out for a day. He became human and stayed human. And not only did he stay human, which was an incredibly humbling process, but he lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death and the worst kind of death at that, a crucifixion. If, if you were God, we'd all like to be, wouldn't we? I mean, I would. If you were God, would, would you for a moment consider allowing yourself not only to limit yourself to, to human abilities, but then to allow yourself to be humiliated, to be beaten, to be killed? I wouldn't allow it. I I can imagine if I was God, I would just sort of be done with people, right? I can't believe that Jesus limited himself like that and allowed all those things to happen. Right now, 
first of all, I think one of the reasons Jesus did that was to truly experience human life, to know what you and I experience, to know what we go through. He knows what, he knows what it's like to live. He knows what it's like to die. He knows what it's like to be loved, and he knows what it's like to be hated. He knows what it's like to, to have deep friendship, and he knows what it's like to be betrayed by your deepest friends. He knows all those things. But I think there's something much deeper going on here. Why would God limit God's self into this human form, truly giving away, letting go of his powers, and allow himself to be killed? Well, there's one thing behind that, isn't there? It's love. Pure and simple, it's love. God's saying, I'm going to stop at nothing to go get my people. I love my people so much that I will stop at nothing to go and get them. And so rather than waiting for you and I to sort of try to rise to God's level, to try to become perfect people and get it all right, our God instead comes down to us and scoops us up in his life, bringing us to himself. That's incredible, isn't it? But in order for that to happen, he had to, he had to completely humble himself and experience an incredibly humiliating process in order to do so. It's an incredible thing. And so Paul uses this phrase. He says he lived a selfless, obedient life and then died a selfless, obedient death. Now remember, Paul is painting a picture for us here of saying, remember, this is who Jesus is. And he's also calling us to live that same way as followers of Jesus. And so I, I want to rest on those words for a moment and have, have you let, the, let them kind of sink in. He lived a selfless, obedient life and died a selfless, obedient death. Now, in a culture where we value more than anything our individual freedoms, which are a gift from God, that idea of obedience, I think, is a really challenging one, isn't it? Because, frankly, I don't want to be obedient to anyone. <laughs> How about you? In fact, I'm a pretty fiercely independent person. Any, if anybody tells me to do something, I'm probably not going to do it only because they told me to. Right? Are any of you like that? Like, if, if you're going to tell me to do it, no way. Right? Ask me nicely, maybe. Anybody with me? Okay, come on. And we read here that Jesus, Jesus lived this selfless, obedient life and selfless, obedient death. Now, you're going to hear this come up again at the end of this passage. I think it's a really challenge. It's a challenge for us. Who are we obedient to? Only our own selves? Or are we obedient to something more than that? Jesus was, and it led him all the way to the cross. So Paul continues in verse 9. He says, Because of that obedience, God lifted him high and honored him far above anyone or anything ever, so that all created beings in heaven and on earth, even those long ago dead and buried, will bow in worship before this Jesus Christ and call out in praise that he is the master of all to the glorious honor of God. So he gives us this imagery of uh, the end of things, when, when this world, when it all comes full circle, and Jesus, we, you and I, are worshiping and honoring our God of all time and all that he's done for us, this beautiful picture of um, when there is great victory and celebration. But then he goes on in verse 12 and 13, and he calls you and I to a certain kind of life. And again, this is, you've just heard what Jesus did. Now how about you? How do we do this together? So he says, what I'm getting at, friends, is that you should simply keep on doing what you've done from the beginning. When I was living among you, you lived in responsive obedience. Now that I'm separated from you, keep it up. Better yet, redouble your efforts. Be energetic in your life of salvation, reverent and sensitive before God. That energy is God's energy, an energy deep within you, God himself willing and working at what will give him the most pleasure. And he speaks of this idea of the Spirit working inside of us, willing and working so that God's will is done. And let us live with this responsive obedience. Let us live with responsive obedience. Responsive to what? Responsive to what and obedient to who? God. 
I would say responsive to the Holy Spirit, obedient to God. All of the Spirit is God. But responsive to the Spirit's work in our lives. And most of us will say, well, I've never heard the Spirit say anything. Well, are we taking time to listen? And not just on our own time, but on God's time. Right? Part of this life as a Christ follower is learning to be people who listen. Learning to be people who are receptive to God's leading. So that then we can be obedient to God's will and hope and desire for us. In verses 14 through 16, he wraps this up. And there's some, I think, really cool in- imagery here. He says, do everything readily and cheerfully. No bickering, no second guessing allowed. Go out into the world uncorrupted. A breath breath of fresh air in this squalid and polluted society. Provide people with a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Carry the light-giving message into the night. So I'll have good cause to be proud of you on the day that Christ returns. You'll be living proof that I didn't go to all this work for nothing. So he's got a couple images here. First he says, be a a breath of fresh air. Now let me ask you this for a moment. Think in your own life. Who would, who for you, and I just want you to think about this, who for you is a breath of fresh air? In your life, who is a breath of fresh air? And what is it about them that makes them a breath of fresh air for you? Just think about that for a moment. Do you suppose you are a breath of fresh air for others? Now, my guess, is, my guess is most of us can't imagine how we might be a breath of fresh air for someone else. Oftentimes, we don't recognize the impact we make or the difference we make in others' lives. And for that alone, friends, please tell those people who you thought of, let them know that they are a breath of fresh air for you because they might not have any idea And it might make a big difference in their lives to know that they are that presence for you. But isn't that incredible imagery to think about how you and I are a breath of fresh air? And then this other imagery he says is to, he says, give people a glimpse of good living and of the living God. Give them a glimpse of the living God. And then he says, carry the light-giving message into the night. Right, now this is the theme that we have talked about over and over again here about shining. Right? That's our theme for our capital appeal. And it's, you know, when we baptize, we give the baptismal candle and we say, let your light so shine before others that they see your good works and give glory to your Father in heaven. Same thing here that Paul is referencing. Take this light-bearing, light-giving message into the night. That's the imagery of what this Christian life is about. We are a breath of fresh air. We are light in the darkness. We said a few weeks ago that As Christians, we should be different. We should be different. In other words, because of this light that's in us, because of this breath of fresh air that we bring, people know that there's something different about us. They might not be able to put their finger on it. They might not know what it is, but there's something different. This is what Paul is calling us to. He says, look at Jesus. He lived a life of selfless obedience, giving himself away, For one reason only, because of his great love for us. And now you and I as his followers are called to imitate. To live a life of responsive obedience. It's challenging, isn't it? To think about being obedient to anyone or anything. But here's, here's, I hope maybe puts the whole picture together. God's desire for this world is not what we often see going on in this world. It's not. Why isn't it? Well, this world is corrupted by you and I, by other human beings. We are sinful people, and we are broken people. We create brokenness. God's will and hope is for restoration, for new life, for people who are are in line with God's will. The idea here is that if you and I live according to God's will, it changes the world. If all of us lived this way, Our homes look different, our neighborhoods look different, our communities look different, our world looks different. Right? It's a much bigger picture of what God is up to. And so Paul says today, be selfless. Be responsive and obedient to God. 
That's the way we're called to live. That's what it means to be a follower of Jesus. And the context for that is not, hey, shape up or else. The context is God's love and grace that's come to this world for you. Now live in response to that. Live in response to it. Say, okay, God, I can do this too. Let's pray. Gracious God, we are challenged today. We're challenged by Paul today to be those who imitate Christ. To be people who not only in our actions, but in our attitudes, live as Jesus did. To humble ourselves. To be people who live in responsive obedience. To be selfless and loving. So God, we pray that you help us to be a breath of fresh air for others. We pray that you help us to be light in dark. We ask you, Lord, to work through us that you would be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray.